My top five takeaways from the Premier League, you know what to expect at this point. It's a somewhat hungover Maxwell dishing out some harsh doses of reality which will fall upon deaf ears and usually result in some uncalled for insults in the comment section. But that's why we love YouTube. So let's get to it. The first one is Liverpool are out of the title race already. Oh my god, you dirty scotch. How could you say that after three games? Well, I'm just looking at history as a fact. Manchester City of the year in which Liverpool gift-wrapped them. The title obtained six points from their first three games. It wasn't the best start, but it, it kept them within the running. And the season after that, Chelsea obtained 12 points from their first four games. They had maximum points going into that. Leicester City had seven points after three games and Liverpool sit with a measly four now it's only two points off of what I mentioned for Manchester City uh, and if other teams weren't performing as well then I think I could comfortably state that it's a little too early but from what I've seen from the Chelsea Man Cities and Manchester United at this point I don't think Liverpool have enough and that's not criticizing them um, in comparison to these other teams it's just stating that I think these teams have set early on their precedent that they've got the depth that can drag games um, from what seem to be mediocre level performances and, and, and kind of push them over that line. And I think that Liverpool don't have the depth. I think that they uh, leak goals too easy, as we've seen against Burnley. Now they bring in Yo Matip, who I think played all right in there. But I think that against Tottenham, who I don't think are the same Tottenham Hotspur from the end of last season, I think they're a little lackluster in front of goal. It was Liverpool's for the taking. Um, and I think it was a mediocre performance both sides and it resulted in a 1-1 draw. And after the first three games, as bold as bold can be, I think that the, it's going to be too far of a reach. And that might not even have been a realistic expectation. Liverpool fans will not admit that. I spoke to several Liverpool fans at the start of the season with uh, Jurgen Klopp at the helm and the rejuvenation process under him with his enthusiasm and his positive football. They thought that they could mix it with the best. They might still do, but at this moment, uh, I'm going to put my neck on the line, my head in the guillotine and basically state that I don't think Liverpool will win the Premier League. <gasps> Shock horror. Second point takeaway is we are so biased towards people that we like. Uh, the Diego Costas of the world, the Luis Suarez of the world, we love to make them into villains and rightfully so, they give us enough uh, kind of of their case study to prove that example. Luis Suarez with his racial points of view that were not uh, obviously fitting to the, not fitting anywhere in the footballing world. Um, his actions off the ball at times, Diego Costa, his actions off the ball at times, um, the whole biting scandal, whether did he or did he not uh, bite uh, Gareth Barry at that point. Um, but what happens is that the media latches on to everything that they do at that point. When they love to vilify a character, it kind of, it uh, puts them in front of the spotlight no matter what they do. Diego Costa farted into the wind and it fell upon a defender's face and he couldn't see, kick him out of the league. And then when, I, when there's a player that we like to put on a pedestal, performs an atrocity, we kind of play it down. Oh, Sergio Aguero may be banned for an elbow. Sergio Aguero uh, may be facing some punishment for uh, a, a, an act of physicality. They don't even kind of brandish it as a deliberate elbow into the throat of Reed. And I love Sergio Aguero. One of my favourite players in the league. But if you're going to kind of create that precedent, um, even though he doesn't have the same track record as those uh, players that, uh, that that have that villainous aspect to them, you still need to tell it for what it is. Look at the headlines everywhere. No one really calls it a really, really rash elbow that could have caused a severe problem. Mark Noble states that Reed couldn't really talk after it when he was substituted. So Sergio Aguero probably going to face punishment now, might miss the Manchester derby. Uh, more and more people not have to scrutinize it for what it is. And it was a very rash, uh, kind of ugly elbow to throw at that point in the game. When you're winning against an opponent um, uh, like West Ham, who I think in Manchester City were in control for most of the game, it was just frustration from Aguero. Maybe he didn't like being the bridesmaid in that game. And maybe that's why he reacted with a harsh elbow. So uh, we are very biased towards people that we like. Uh, and collectively, in media, in journalism, we need to scrutinize someone when they perform an atrocity like that. Next up is uh, the grappling in the box is becoming harder and harder to differentiate. So we have these new rules where uh, basically the referees are stamping down on acts of physicality in the box and, and handing out penalties we see with Manchester City versus Stoke. It was punished on both ends of the park and then the same thing happened this weekend. Uh, Bournemouth's Charlie Daniels was punished on Saturday uh, for his, uh, his tackling in the boxes, wrestling with Christian Benteke. But then the same thing happened in Tottenham's game where Vertonghen kind of escaped with a warning uh, on Liverpool's Joel Matip. So it's this inconsistency which is causing cloudiness in the Premier League and I don't like it. Either punish everyone and make sure that no one's got their hands on in the box. Therefore, it's going to be harsher on the likes of John Terry who likes to kind of reenact the Royal Rumble sequence inside the box 
or let everyone away with it. So you cannot have this inconsistency because it's going to cause a problem and it's going to put referees under the spotlight more so than they already are. Uh, and I think that, I mean, there's a Mike Dean uh, best bits floating around on Facebook. You need to check it out. It's hilarious. But that's what's happening. These referees are now being either vindicated or they're being highlighted. When referees realistic are there to direct traffic, they shouldn't be this under the spotlight. If a referee is under the spotlight, whether it's for something good or something bad, I don't think he's doing his job right. The referees should not be highlighted. They are literally there to make sure that the game flows. So these new rules in place kind of cause us to, to vilify referees or put them in a spotlight. And I think they should be there, as always, just to kind of allow the game to flow smoothly. And the next point that uh, I'm going to talk about, someone number four, I believe, is that depth will win the Premier League. Now, my fandom towards Manchester United aside, I just think that it was a great example as to what depth can bring you. Um, the first thing I'm going to do before I get into that is I'm going to rip apart some Manchester United fans out there who are so uh, uh, kind of blinded by their loving of a new face that they just criticise someone else without even realising it. So if you looked on Twitter, everyone was slaughtering Wayne Rooney. It wasn't Wayne Rooney's best performance by a long shot. He was giving the ball away at times, but just because he wasn't, uh, he's not the same stature as a new face like Zlatan, they consistently are scrutinising Wayne Rooney. When Zlatan couldn't trap a bag of cement in that game, everything was bouncing off him, everything was hitting off him. It wasn't his day. I'm not going to sit there and rip him apart. The guy had three goals in two games up to that point in the Premier League. But if you're going to rip Wayne Rooney apart, and then he's the, 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 main benefit, he's the main reason why you ended up getting that goal towards the end. He beats his man, gets into a good position, plays it on a platter for Marcus Rashford. Rashford runs away, takes all the plaudits, and people are like, oh, Rooney shouldn't have even been on anyway. He was shit to that point. That's why Jose Mourinho kept him on, because he knew that if he wanted someone in that clutch situation, Wayne Rooney has been there and done it. I'm sick of people consistently ripping Rooney apart because he's the easy target. Manchester United get everything they want, and they still want to rip things apart. They still want to terrorise people like Wayne Rooney when, yeah, he's not a Paul Pogba just because he's not got that price tag or he's not as Latin. It doesn't mean that they don't deserve to be scrutinised and Wayne Rooney's just the, the man who's to get the target on his back at all points. He's the reason you got the three points. Take it or leave it. Whether or not he didn't perform well, 89 minutes out of the 90, and then comes up with that assist, that's what he's there to do. If Zlatan uh, scored that winning goal towards the end, oh, what a game Zlatan had. He's always there. He's right there in the right place at the right time. I thought Zlatan was shit, and that's just me being honest in that game. But I'm not going to rip him apart in the next game because I know what he can contribute. Wayne Rooney's a very similar player, the way that he might not deliver for the 89 minutes, but when you need him to, he comes up clutch in the end. And then the last point to take us home in this clip is that I really am loving Antonio Conte's start, Pep Guardiola's start, because it just completely debunks this myth that a philosophy takes time to build in the Premier League, that it's so hard, it's this chemical equation that you need to try and fit X, Y and Z into this and then it's E equals MC squared and it's that. Similarly to what Louis van Gaal would consistently use as an excuse, it takes time, it takes time to build this. Shut up mate, you were just a failed manager who could not make it happen, you didn't have control over your team. Antonio Conte, it's not all roses at the moment at Chelsea, but they looked mechanical, but they also looked brilliant going forward and Chelsea are going to be a force to be reckoned with. It wasn't pretty for Manchester City at every point in the game against West Ham but their philosophy they bought into it early on. It's not this... Uh, it, 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 people make football so much more complicated than what it is. If everyone buys into the system and everyone's working hard you will get success. It won't be immediate but you will see success. People didn't buy into Manchester United's system under Louis van Gaal. People didn't believe in what he was teaching. That's why it failed. It was nothing to do with taking time to build the philosophy. It was he didn't make the right signings. He relied on youth to bail him out. And it's just been found out now that football is not as complicated as people make it out to be. Uh, and the perfect start from both Manchester teams and Chelsea, uh, Chelsea so far has proven that if you get a manager that comes in and is confident in his own ability and people buy into his system, then success can happen. Success is a choice. That's the name of a book I read once. Either way, let me know what you think in the comment section below about my five points from the Premier League this weekend. We're going to go into it in more depth tomorrow when I get back into the studio with Jason. Uh, we'll chat more so about maybe Sergio Aguero faces punishment. Maybe he is going to sit out in the Manchester derby. What do you think of that? Um, on Twitter, Francis underscore Maxwell. And as always, it's been a pleasure spending my Sunday afternoon with you lads instead of watching Stranger Things. Catch you. Oh, didn't press stop.